Listener Production. Hello, Sasha Barbagat with you for today's briefing. 30 years ago, the bilby was on the brink of extinction, but a massive conservation effort has seen numbers bounce back spectacularly. And it's in part thanks to chocolate. Some of the chocolate bilbies uh, have a portion of funds that go to conservation groups. And even if they don't, you know, it's a better alternative than buying a rabbit. In today's deep dive, we're covering the feel-good Easter success story that is the bilby. First, though, here are today's top stories from the Listener Newsroom. It's Good Friday, the 29th of March. Easter exodus. Good morning. I'm Celeste Mitsu. Today is the busiest day for most Australian airlines. Closely followed by Easter Monday, Jetstar expects 59,000 customers to take to the skies. The most popular domestic route is Sydney to Melbourne and internationally it's to Bali. Chief Operating Officer Matt Franzi says there are more services and more staff so things keep running smoothly. Over the last year, we've listened to all of our customer feedback around our operations, and it's been great to see the ongoing improvements across our operation. In fact, we've invested across our operations from aircraft to people and to the customer journey. While King Charles has called for more kindness in his recorded Easter message as His Majesty and the Princess of Wales have stepped back from royal duties to undergo cancer treatment. It is for me... A great sadness that I cannot be with you all today. China has lifted heavy tariffs on Australian wine. They were imposed four years ago after the relationship between Beijing and Canberra soured over human rights, national security and COVID. And AFL boss Andrew Dillon has told all clubs player wellbeing will remain at the forefront of their illicit drugs policy. Changes are expected to be made next year, but for now it means no sanction on the first offence. It follows wild accusations made under parliamentary privilege this week that players have been faking injuries to cover a positive drugs test. In sport, first up in the AFL, a slow start to the season, but the reigning premiers have roared back, downing the Lions by 20 points at the Gabba, 14-8, 92-10, to 12-72. Magpie Brody Majacek has told Triple M the message from Fly was simple. Just do it, really. I think uh, do what we do best and uh, us... Uh bringing that pressure every game and, and yeah, making teams fumble and our best footy is, is when that's, that's our um, one would. Well, a rare incident from veteran Scott Pendlebury may put him in MRO hot water. He was caught giving an open hand slap to the stomach of Lockie Neal late in the third quarter. Switching codes to the NRL, Penrith have extended their winning streak to nine over the Roosters, 22 to 16. The son of Triple M's Mark Geyer made his debut last night. Maverick says it was epic. So special. Um, I was a bit nervous all week and finally getting out in that second half, I was pumped and the boys got a good start and just had to hold that win and uh, it was the best thing ever. Well, a controversial bunker call denied Joey Manu a try in the first half. Fellow chook Jared Wubira Hargraves was ruled to have obstructed Dylan Edwards from attempting a cover tackle. And we're off to Game 5 in the NBL Grand Final Series after Melbourne United outlasted the Jack Jumpers 88-86. to Thanks for that update from the Listener Newsroom. Stick around for our deep dive on Bilbies. We're lucky in Australia to have an abundance of amazing native wildlife, but the effects of farming, climate change and feral animals has decimated a number of species. Sometimes, though, we get a conservation success story, and today we are talking about one of those, the bilby. Conservation efforts ramped up 30 years ago when the cute desert marsupials were close to the brink of extinction, and a big part of that was raising both awareness and funds through the creation of the chocolate bilby. These hit the shelves in the 90s as an Aussie alternative to Easter bunnies and quickly won us over. So how much of the bilby's success story is down to something as simple as Easter chockey? To find out, I'm joined now by Joey Clark from the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. Joey, thank you for being here. Look, 30 years ago, bilbies were on the brink and now their population has increased. Tell us how that's happened. Yeah, look, one of the things that we've come to understand over the past 30 years is just how important the threat of feral predators has been for Australian animals. So that's things like feral cats and foxes, which basically arrived in Australia and decimated a whole range of our native mammals. 
one of those was the bilby. So 30 years ago, uh, they were confined to about a fifth of their original range, and that's in parts of the Tanami Desert, Western Australia and the Northern Territory, and a little patch in Queensland where they're still hanging on. But we really didn't know that much about why they declined and what we could do to turn it around. So what was done then once that was recognised, how did we then go about protecting the populations of bilbies so that they could start increasing their population again? Yeah, there's been fantastic work over the last couple of decades to create safe havens. So these are very large scale fenced areas. We're not talking about a zoo or a small sanctuary. These are like big chunks of the landscape that have been fenced off. The cats and foxes have been removed and then we're able to bring back the native species that used to occur there. So my organisation, Australian Wildlife Conservancy, has about 10 of these safe havens um, and six of those are home to thriving populations of bilbies. It's really, a, it's sort of a simple conservation problem in that for species like bilbies that breed very quickly, if you just reduce that predation pressure, they can bounce back really fast. Mm. So it's a good news story then for the bilby. Absolutely. We've now got populations across four states where 30 years ago, you know, they were extinct in those regions. So that's wow. super exciting. All right. So what has that taught us then? So obviously the work's been done to recognise the issue and then to try and address it. And as you say, the bilbies are kind of lucky in that they breed quite quickly. But what lessons can we take now from that success story and translate it to other animals? Is there similar work going on with other species? Absolutely. So these safe havens that are feral predator-free areas are now home to numbats, bilbies, betongs, a whole range of little bandicoots and things that people might not have heard of. So Mm. we've got these landscapes now filling up with the animals that should have been there all along. So that's part of the solution, and that's, that's stopping things going extinct. But in the long term, we don't want to rely on fenced areas. We want bandicoots everywhere. We want bilbies everywhere. We want them to repopulate outside of these safe havens. But before we get to that point, we're going to have to come up with a solution for cats and foxes that works at a a much bigger scale across the landscape. And there's, there's ongoing research into that. My parents live in a rural area and I often see signs up in the bush around their place, you know, fox poisonings and things Mm. like that, which is Sad to think about, Mm. but necessary in order to protect native wildlife. What else can be done, if anything? Look, I think there's a range of great organisations that are at the front line of battling feral predators, but also of bilby conservation and these sorts of conservation reintroductions. Supporting those, so Australian Wildlife Conservancy is one of them, and people can make a donation to any of those organisations if they'd like to help. There are opportunities to volunteer, But I think the Easter bilby, it sort of comes back to that, you know, being familiar with the nature that we're so lucky to have here in Australia. Just raising that awareness is itself helping the community become more involved and engaged in that conservation effort because it takes all of us. Yeah. Why are bilbies so important to the ecosystem? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So they're these animals that, you know, we talk about them as a bit like a bunny, but there's actually nothing like them on earth. They're marsupials, so they have a pouch. They've got these long ears and soft, silky fur, so they look fantastic. They're so cute. Yeah, a black tail with a white tip, and you sort of see that, you know, flopping around as they run off through (laughs) the bush. And they move in a way that's sort of like a slow gallop or half hop, half gallop, so really sort of weird-looking animal. Mm. Um, They feed mostly on insects and, and grubs and tubers and things that are underground, and they use their ears to hear them and their nose to smell them. So they're shuffling around with not very good eyesight. And in the process of digging for that food, they actually turn over a lot of soil and leaf litter. And if you imagine that used to happen across two thirds of the Australian mainland, and now that process has stopped. So without bilbies turning over nutrients, aerating the soil, and, you know, along with the other animals that used to live there, we've lost a really important process in those landscapes. So it's not just about stopping bilbies going extinct but also restoring healthy ecosystems through that digging and burrowing that so many native animals do. Mm. I want to talk about another way that we can help bilby numbers. And this I need you to explain because I don't quite get it, is increasing the dingo population. How does that work? Yeah, this is interesting. You know, ecology is always very complex. There are, you know, you'll remember sort of food chains and diagrams like that from high school or uni, whatever. You know, there, there are complex relationships between these different predators. So dingoes we know have been in Australia for a long time and we've observed that when dingoes are persecuted, so they're baited or poisoned, that actually allows feral cats and foxes to increase. 
And so it's kind of this domino effect of, you know, trying to control one predator releases this big abundance of another one, which is much more problematic for bilbies. So dingoes don't have that direct effect on bilbies. They might prey on them occasionally, but they've actually got a really broad diet. They'll eat insects and vegetation, all sorts of stuff. So that's why controlling dingoes or, you know, supporting a healthy dingo population can benefit small native mammals like bilbies. Now, a big part of the bilbies success story is around Easter, which is why we're talking to you today. And that was with the creation of the chocolate bilby. Tell us how important something as innocuous as making a chocolate Australian native animal has been to helping preserve them. Yeah, look, I think it's fantastic that there's now a generation of kids and, you know, young adults now who've grown up familiar with the Easter bilby as our our kind of homegrown Aussie alternative to the Easter bunny. That idea of sort of raising awareness through incorporating native animals into what is a a national celebration and public holiday, I think was a, a genius one. And it means that we're becoming more and more familiar with the animals that we are responsible for looking after. So the bilby is one of those, but, you know, there are wombats, there are koalas, of course, that we know. And I think by looking after the bilby, it also means we're more conscious of that whole range of biodiversity that Australians need to protect. What about uh, government regulations, government policies, all that red tape stuff? What is the government, both from a state and federal perspective, you know, where are they falling short and where can they lift their game and do more to help conservation efforts? There's been some really good progress, again, in recent years, and partly that's been through public-private partnerships. So our organisation partnered with the New South Wales government to establish two new bilby populations in the state, and we're really grateful for that opportunity. Um, At a federal level, they've recently developed a new recovery plan, and that's got much better engagement now with Indigenous communities for whom the bilby is really spiritually significant. So one of the, the places I work in Central Australia the name for the bilby in Walpuri is Ninu. So when we released bilbies there, it was a a Ninu returning home back Mm. to to where they were from. So uh, things like the development of that recovery plan are really important for collaborating with the different organisations that are involved and getting everyone on the same page. And I think that's where government plays an important role as, as leaders and coordinators. But we know that the job is too big for government alone. The The job of conservation in Australia will need all of us. It'll need non-government organisations. It'll need private capital. It'll need governments and, and national parks and that sort of traditional form of conservation too. And I think if we do all come together like that, there's a bright future for the bilby. How can someone listening to this who maybe wants to do their own part What can we do as everyday citizens to not only help conservation efforts for the bilby, but also other native Australian animals? I think one of the most important things is getting out into the bush around you. You know, we've talked about recognising the the nature that's around us. That's everywhere. So, you know, even in Sydney, we've got beautiful native birds. We've got bandicoots living in some of the suburbs Mm -hmm. in our biggest cities. So nature really is all around us. And I think if people feel engaged with the landscape around them, it sort of has that that direct responsibility. It, it brings it home that we are stewards of the environment. It's not something out there that we need yeah. to look after. I think that's really important. And should we buy a bilby chocolate at Easter? Does that help too? Absolutely. Yeah. So some of the chocolate bilbies uh, have a portion of funds that go to conservation groups. And even if they don't, you know, it's a, a better alternative than buying a rabbit. We've talked about the Easter bilby effect, I suppose you could call it, in raising awareness for young people and families and people who might not have heard of it to go, oh, and associate it with something positive like a holiday, Easter. What then should we be giving to Halloween or Christmas? Have you guys got any ideas of animals that, you know, could potentially benefit from a similar sort of campaign? I love this idea. One of the species (laughs) that we're working with at the moment is the northern hairy-nosed wombat. Um, (laughs) Another one that's right on the brink of extinction, only a few hundred left. You know, maybe that can be a Santa Claus equivalent that, you know, delivers (laughs) presents in a sack. I love that. Um, Yeah, we did some work with sugar gliders over Christmas a few years ago to try and raise their profile. And, you know, these are incredible animals. We're so lucky to have that diversity to choose from. Mm. Um, I think we should celebrate them and any opportunity to do so. We, we need to embrace that. Absolutely. Uh, Joey, thanks so much for talking to us today. We appreciate your passion for Australia's native animals and thanks for coming in and spending your time with us. Thanks, Sasha. 
That was Joey Clark from the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. And that is all for today's podcast. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a fabulous long weekend ahead. I'm Sasha Barbagat. See you next time. Listener.